You're listening to Rethinking Trade with Lori Wallach. Small business owners and farmers are protesting the cream WTO and NAFTA are transnational forms of autocratic governance that support the European North American free trade agreement. Seattle has never seen anything like it. Fire and tear gas into the people. This is the Rethinking Trade Podcast. Rethinking Trade Welcome back to Rethinking Trade, where we don't just talk about trade policy, we fight to change it. I'm Ryan, and I'm joined once again by our in-house trade expert, Lori Wallach. Lori, on today's show, we're going to be giving listeners a bit of a 101 on digital trade policies and some of the major issues of concern they bring with them. I'll be honest, I know very little about this, so why don't you just give us all an introduction? First, what does digital trade cover, and what are some examples of these rules in action? So like so many elements of our so-called trade agreements, this has nothing to do with trade. It's simply the big tech platforms trying to inject their goals and policies into trade agreements, such as banning governments from breaking up their monopolies, from protecting our privacy, et cetera. So the rules are called digital trade, but they actually affect everything. Because basically, if you think about what so-called online digital platforms touch, it can be everything from us as consumers buying some product. It could be what happens with our data when we are on Facebook or on another social media platform. It can be a farmer and a tractor using geolocation data to figure out how much fertilizer to put on some part of a field. It can be all the smart utilities and smart products in our houses, like our refrigerator, our microwave, which are all wired together, can be in our alarm systems. Basically, our coming, our going, and almost everything we do, listening in our cars to online services, all of that is covered by these rules. So effectively, it's like the big tech wish list backwards of corporate power imposed on lots of elements of our lives, pretending it's a new chapter on so-called digital trade. Let's get into some of the big examples of what these policies look like in real life. You've already mentioned the big tech companies. Who are some of the other winners and who are the losers? Losers are consumers. Losers are workers. There are four big areas of policy that big tech tries to jam into trade agreements. This is just a new thing. There's a push to do it right now at the World Trade Organization. That has been ongoing for several years. The NAFTA, the new NAFTA has these rules. The TPP has some of these rules. Those are really the two agreements that have these rules and the one big global agreement that could impose them against us if we don't fight back. And number one, the rules that limit what governments can do to protect our privacy. This comes out in the context of rules in trade agreements for free flow of data as if somehow data is a commodity, data being our private and personal information. (laughs) And the trade agreements treat that information as a commodity owned by the tech platforms and basically forbids things like the European system of requiring the data cannot go out of the European boundaries where very strict privacy and consumer protections apply unless the place the data is going has similar protections. The trade agreements call that localization or data protection, which is just trying to take trade words and put it onto what we would call basic privacy protections. So free flow of data is one of the big demands, and obviously that makes it almost impossible to protect our privacy. Second thing is what are trade secret protections. So a lot of these platforms run on very fancy algorithms. And those algorithms, as has been reported repeatedly, have built in all kinds of discrimination. Racial discrimination vis-a-vis who gets to see what job and a job listing application. Racial discrimination vis-a-vis housing and what advertisements for rental availabilities or houses for sale. Plus, there's all kinds of really skeezy marketing that targets people in invasive ways. And even if the government needs to, for instance, get copies of those algorithms to prove that there has been a violation of federal law, racial discrimination, 
the trade agreements guarantee the online platform secrecy over those algorithms. So it sort of locks in their ability to do all kinds of illegal, if not illegal, at least bad things with how their platforms are run. And then there are rules that basically require governments to provide waivers against liability for these companies. So in U.S. law, there is a a particular waiver that was created 20 years ago. It was to basically protect free speech on the internet. It said if somebody put something up defamatory on a then, they were largely bulletin boards, the company that runs the bulletin board is not responsible for somebody, you know, sending out an email that's like Microsoft sucks or posting on a platform Microsoft sucks. There are actual cases with Amazon where Amazon was selling these hoverboard scootery things that were either counterfeit and not the real products, so dangerous fake ones, and or some of the real products had faulty batteries, and it literally was burning down people's houses. And despite this being Amazon selling a faulty product, which when these products were sold in brick and mortar stores, obviously the company that made them and the company that sold them were liable Because it was online, this immunity waiver, which is called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, the online platforms are basically using that waiver to try and say they're not responsible for any kinds of foreign interference activities on the different platforms or false information. So all of that protection is being exported through our trade agreements, which require every country has this kind of immunity waiver as compared to, of course, if a platform is being used as a sales platform, that just because it's online shouldn't mean that you're not responsible, Amazon, if the product is counterfeit or dangerous. So those are some of the main things that are in these trade agreements that are incredibly dangerous for people (laughs) and workers, but also are totally unrelated to trade. It's just a gimmick to use these secretive negotiations to handcuff governments from regulating these platforms. And then the final one is the agreements have service sector rules that make it impossible to break up monopolies. They basically ban governments from setting rules on how many services, types of service, or the size of the service or company is providing for any particular service provider. And so, you know, there's a lot of argument that some of these online platforms should be broken up as a matter of just monopoly. And these trade agreement protections, again, totally unrelated to trade, basically guarantee these corporations that they have the right to be as big as they want, do as much as they want with no government interference, which in many instances conflicts with domestic law. But the trade agreements are such that if you follow the domestic law, the country that follows the law and would act in violation of all these outrageous rules would face millions of dollars, billions, potentially in trade sanctions. So we're really basically talking about some of the biggest corporations in the history of the world shaping and conversely being potentially reined in by these digital trade rules, many of which have nothing to do with real trade. Seems like a fairly big deal and fairly complicated. How do we, uh, you know, how, let me say it again. How do we start unraveling this? What are the kinds of policy alternatives that could be used to reverse this kind of runaway corporate power in the, in the digital trade world? The basic point is we can't allow the big tech platforms to rig our trade agreements with these new rights and privileges that have nothing to do with trade. So increasingly, Congress here and in other countries' parliaments are taking on the big tech platforms and trying to protect our privacy and trying to break them up. And so what's at stake is just simply not allowing them to infect our trade agreements because if Amazon goes to Congress and basically says, I'm sorry, you can't contemplate breaking us up. We have a right to be as big as we want and do whatever we want. And Congress would say, uh, we're going to pass a new law. Or we're going to do something that changes that. Trade agreement shouldn't stop that. If Facebook wants to go to Congress and say, hey, we have algorithms that are totally racially discriminatory, but you can't see them. Domestic law may allow you to prosecute us, but you can't do it because of a trade agreement. Or if Google has search engines and is collecting all this data and is outsourcing it and selling it against privacy protections because they've shipped it off 
our medical and banking records currently have privacy protections in the U.S. They ship it overseas and then sell it. Those kind of violations need to be stopped. So it's simply a matter of not allowing these new rights and protections for the big companies to get inserted into trade agreements. And we can win because people are increasingly against these platforms and aware of what they're doing. So if we work together, we can make sure that the new WTO agreement that the big tech companies are pushing to get these rights worldwide does not go into action, does not get completed, does not get enacted. And we can do the same with respect to making sure these rules aren't in any future trade agreements that we have, like the ones right now being negotiated with Kenya and the UK. But here's the thing. If we don't make sure that people wake up to this threat and help organize people who care about their privacy, who care about online discrimination, who want to break up the big tech monsters, if we don't make sure folks know that this is going on and we all don't work together to take action, we could see all of these big tech giants using the trade negotiations to undermine the very goals and policies that domestically around the world activists are fighting for. It's a totally winnable fight, but we could lose it if we don't become aware and take action now. That's all for today. Thank you all for listening. Rethinking Trade is produced by Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. I would encourage you to visit rethinktrade.org as well as tradewatch.org to educate yourself and to find out how you can get involved in the work we're doing to fight for fairer and more equitable trade policies.